So the story begins in the 17th century when um, a great woman of that century, Lady Anne Clifford, she, she was a philanthropist, she bought land in Exeter in memory of her mother. She set up a trust and the trust uh, stated that part of the rent of the land would go towards the education of a poor child in the parish of St. Stephen's. So, fast forward 150 years or so, beginning of the 19th century, it was known as the parish field and it was being rented out every seven years to local farmers. By the mid 19th century, the, the ground was also being used by traveling uh, shows. They were setting up here in, in the summer months and cricket was being played, rugby was being played here. The first reference to association football being played on the ground is on Saturday the 6th of October 1894 when Exeter AFC played Minehead. We, we're, we're told that the, in some parts the, the, the grass was, was knee deep uh, so we have, a, we have a, an image of what it, what it might have been, been, been like at that time. Exeter AFC then reformed and became Exeter United a couple of seasons later. And Exeter United played here. A pivotal moment for association football in Exeter was in October 1902 when Exeter United played St Sidwell's United and St Sidwell's won 3-0 and were hailed the, the city club, the, the best team in Exeter. St. Sibyls were formed in 1901. We, these are the origins of our club. In 1904, St. Sibyls changed the name to Exeter City. They kept the nickname, the Grecians. They kept the colors, green and white. And uh, in 1908, uh, the, the club Exeter City uh, hired the first professional. There was a scheme to introduce professional football in, in, in Exeter. And there were three stages to that. The first was the club becoming a limited liability company. The second, uh, an agreement was made with the Clifford Trust that the ground could be leased for 21 years. And thirdly, in May 1908, the club were elected to Division One of the Southern League. So by the end of the decade, Exeter had its first professional football club and first class football was up and running. The first big challenge once City went professional was rather bizarrely the length of the pitch because unlike today the pitch was much shorter and interestingly it was too short for the regulations of the FA Cup and this meant that opponents we drew at home refused to play here. In 1910 we played Reading at the old county ground, the rugby ground, um, but the following opponents, Nelson and Burnley, refused to play an extra at all and we had to play at their grounds. So something had to be done about the pitch but the landowner wasn't keen to sell the land to the club. So the local MP, Henry Duke, intervened and he actually persuaded the landowner to sell him 20 foot of land and the MP then rented that to the club. And that meant we could elongate the pitch very much as it is today and um, once again play FA Cup ties at home. And that was good news because in 1914, after thumping Portsmouth 4-0 away in the first round, we got the plum draw. We drew Aston Villa, the cup holders, here at home and it was really the first time that we'd had cup fever in Exeter. Uh, so the champions, the cup holders came here, a crowd of nearly 10,000 uh, were here to watch it, enjoying the, the new facilities, and Exeter just got edged out 2-1, but it was a very proud day for the club. Of course, within a few months, everything changed. World War I broke out, and in fact, in the first season, 14-15, football continued to be played here. Um, but it was played with an increasing amount of disapproval. Uh, people felt the players should be fighting at the front, not, not playing football. And indeed, when we played West Ham here at home uh, in, in 1914, there was a big public meeting at the end of the game where 
army recruitment officials tried to persuade people who hadn't yet signed up to sign up. The end of 1915, um, uh, the last game of the season was played at home to Reading and then the ground was transferred to the military authorities and throughout the war it was used for army purposes. So there was a lot of drilling going on, a lot of marching up and down, shooting practice, uh, but the ground was still kept for, uh, in condition to play football and um, a lot of charity matches were played during the war to raise money for various wartime charities. So that took us right up to 1919 when football started again. Um, amazingly, the first fixture in that Southern League 1919-20 uh, season was at home to Reading and they were the team that we'd last played uh, before the war. So there's a certain symmetry to that. Uh, so football got going again and on we went into the... So the 1920s is really, it looks like a period of, of uh, real development, real development and change for Exeter City Football Club. It kicks off, I mean it really starts, we've come out of the back of the First World War and you've got the National Football League starting which really gives sort of a boost to a sport that's been massively interrupted by, by the First World War. And so Exeter City become one of the founder members of the Football League in the old Division 3. So the first games played in 1920, the start of the 2021 season, and you get about 6,000 people coming through the turnstile to watch City win 3-0, with William Wright scoring the first ever league goal for the club. It doesn't pan out like that for the rest of the decade. The highest finish is about eighth in the league. They get to the third round of the League Cup one time, get knocked out by Leeds United. But it is a time when the club kind of, it, it starts to find its feet, it finds its identity, it becomes more recognisable as the Exeter City people will become familiar with for years after that. Um, one of the issues is financial. Entering into the Football League comes with its own difficulties as, as modern football fans will recognise. And so City have to develop players um, and sell players, one of these being the famous goalkeeper, Dick Pym who sold to Bolton Wanderers for £5,000 and that sale amongst a few other transfers that summer in the early 1920s means the City can then buy the ground outright, they can own the land at St James's Park and they can start building the football club, they can own their football club and develop it and the community plays a big role in this as well. Um, supporters groups are coming together raising money and funds and again things that we're familiar with and of course there's other stuff like youth development and one of the players that emerges in the 1920s is Cliff Bastin who this stand that I'm still on now is named after years and years later but he's a local boy he goes to Ladysmith School and he only plays a handful of games for the city um, and he's picked up and he's sold to Arsenal he goes on to be one of the best players in England, winning the league, the FA Cup, playing for England, etc. So that's cool. It's cool to see these players coming through. And then there's other changes. That's on the pitch. Off the pitch, you get lots of changes around the stadium. So in 1926, the old grandstand, the original old grandstand, burns to the ground. There's a fire, the fire's so hot it can be felt all the way down where the John Lewis building is now. There's a massive blaze, people come out to see it and everything is completely destroyed. Everything from the roof and the walls and the seats to the players' kit and their boots, etc. So this really forces the club into action and it forces the community into action. And they, they both get together and they, they raise the necessary funds to build the new grandstand, the old grandstand. And then on the other side, you had the popular stand, and the popular stand, or the Primrose Bank, that used to be uncovered. They get a roof on that, and it becomes what people recognise later on as the cow sheds. So the 1920s, a real time of change on and off the pitch. Um, you see developments that the club won't see again for another 80, 80 or so years. I think the 1930s must have been wild in Exeter. 
you know, you, you think of it as black and white, and yet 1930, 30, when we played Sunderland, my father came, he was eight. 20,000 people here, 20,000 in this little ground. You know, the whole place was a carnival. It must have been colorful, red and white. It just must have been so vivid. You know, I forget the fact that you think of the austerity coming out of the 20s and the general strike and stuff like that, and actually, you know, and the teams changing. Why did Exodus football team change every season? Because they didn't pay the wages through the summer, so they left. You know, I always wondered why they always had a new set of players, but in the 30s it kind of started changing, so they were keeping players for more than one season. Um, people like uh, Stan Hurst, where we've got his medal now, or we've seen access to the medal he won in the cup. Cup, I want the cup back. <laughs> you know, you, a lot of the people that come and watch football in Exeter aren't from Exeter. You, there were, what was the population in Exeter in those days? 80, 90,000? They're not all from Exeter. I mean, who wasn't at the game? Who wasn't involved? I, I, I don't know how, what it was like around the place, but you can imagine you know, when we had the South End when we got relegated what the place was like and how busy the streets were and everything. You know, in, in the big games, the streets are busy outside, even when the match is on. You know, there's people peering over, there's people standing in the tree, the popular trees over there, the houses at the end, they still, they were there then. You know, people looking out through the houses, but they must have just been absolutely buzzing. Like on a good day now, you know, where it's colorful when the, you get the noise, you know, the, you, you can all remember the Liverpool game in the noise, that was 9,000 people. Double that, and people not being restrained, and those stupid rattles that they used to. You know, one in three people got a, got a rattle. You know, it just must have been as exciting as Liverpool. Put the Liverpool. Imagine what that's like. People can feel that today. How noisy that was. The Huddersfield game. How noisy. Eight thousand people. You know, we're talking about matches where you had sixteen, twenty thousand on a regular, semi-regular basis. And, and just, you know, in, in ending up with 39-40. And we all know what happened in 39-40 when the football stopped and we were top of the league or second in the league at the time. There's an irony there. It seems the same happened in the 1914 when the First World War broke out. We were just sort of ready to take off again. It seems to be a theme with Exeter City when things are going well. <laughs> Something <laughs> outside <laughs> stops them. So. I don't know, I just think it would have been a really exciting place to be. So in the 1940s, St James's Park was no longer host to professional football. Um, it didn't mean the end of the ground uh, for local use, community use. Um, it was decided that a regional tournament wouldn't quite suit the footballing needs of the community because the blackout times are coming in a lot closer. You know, no one wants to watch football without having a beer and they've all, all got to head home. So it was decided that a more, um, to keep, keep the interest, it'd be better to have more prestige friendlies. Um, there was boxing talked about here as well. The army had requisitioned the ground, so it was in use for the Home Guard. There's a photograph over by the original bank of the Home Guard with their fixed bayonets and there's about 3,000 fans behind them all cheering them on. So it's a, it's a way that, again, community aspect, community coming out, supporting a team of sorts at SJP. One of the photos of the Home Guard on the pitch shows them in front of the big bank, just off to my side here. Um, it's all overgrown, um, almost like a jungle. And um, there's actually stories of local kids coming in and playing amongst the terracing and the flowers and the, and the weeds and shrubbery and kind of experiencing and playing their own little war games. So the ground was in constant use throughout the war, but as we sort of came into peacetime, in sort of 19, 1946, the club reformed, football was played here again, the sort of the detritus of war had been removed, the terracing on the, on the big bank had been repurposed and was now considered a very comfortable place to watch, to watch local football. After, after what had been a really tough period for the area, you know, St Sidwell's ward had been completely bombed out. The club needed a huge amount of rebuilding, but they did actually take it on like the community and worked upwards into the next, into the next decade. I 
I was met at the station by Norman Dudgeon and he took me up the club and it was obvious from looking at Exeter, Sidwell Street at the time, that it was not long after the war. And there were a lot of premises that had been bombed. And it was clear that, uh, you know, the place was a bit run down from that way. But when I got to the football club, it was like Wembley. I thought it was brilliant because it was absolutely dead flat and it was covered in grass. Pontypridd doesn't have pitches like that. Not flat and not covered in grass. So I couldn't wait to get out there. Playing in front of big crowds on the pitch that looked like Wembley to me, I found that playing out in front of the stands was fantastic. Playing on the left wing, you get to hear, if you're listening, and if you're a young player, you tend to listen. And you hear these comments, individual comments, especially from people in the stand. I don't know why, but on the Bob Bank, uh, they were all of a muchness and they were all together, I think. But in the stand, you had selective comments. Like, go back home, Reese. Or, oh, well done, Graham, you know, and it, it seemed to be 50-50. You'd get really good comments coming out, and the next minute you'd do something <laughs> stupid, and they'd, oh, they'd be on your back, you know. There was nothing better than playing on the left wing on the other side, away from the stand, along the Bob Bank, because it was usually heavy over there. It was a, the, the pitch was usually heavy. And if you were like me, you were a trier. You weren't brilliant like Gordon Dale, and it, it, it hindered him a bit. It didn't hinder me, because I was plowing through the mud. And the crowd loved it. If you plowed through the mud and kept going, and fullbacks were slithering all over the place, and you were kept going through the mud and get into the byline, the crowd loved it. And yeah, they were really supportive on the backside. The standard of football in the early 50s was quite good, but the players were getting on a bit. They were all players that I looked up to. I was in awe of those players. They'd all played for Manchester United. Andy Donaldson played for Newcastle, Ray Eagledon for Leeds. But they were all in their early 30s. And I thought they were old men. So they were good, but they weren't up to the standard that we got by 1958-9. Frank Broom had come in, and the 58-9 team, that was real quality. If you went through the team, the two wingers, Nelson Stiffel and Gordon Dale, that were outstanding. Nelson Stiffel, as quick as a greyhound. Gordon Dale, an absolute ballet dancer on the pitch. He must be the second best player to cliff busting that the club's ever had. Ted Cullen, big strong centre forward. Johnny Nichols had played for West Brom in the FA Cup and England, he was inside left. Jimmy Thompson at left half was two stone overweight, but he had a left foot that was absolutely brilliant. And he could pick me out. I was doing lots of runs forward in those days sort of Jamie Vardy type. I'm not comparing myself to Jamie Vardy, but that sort of game. And Jimmy Thompson could pick me out with his left foot going through. And we had a strong defence. Uh, Arnold Mitchell and Keith Harvey. Theo Foley, who went on to have a great career at Northampton. Les MacDonald. And a great goalkeeper in George Hunter. It was the best team I've ever played for. I was inside right, only missed a couple of games. I was probably the worst player in the team, but I scored 22 goals. Ted Cullen scored 27 goals. We had 49 goals between us, which I say is a, an all-time club record for twin strikers. 49 goals in one season. There should be a plaque on the wall. Uh, 
1963, I came from Cambridge City. That particular season, obviously, was the promotion uh, team, which um, was the first time Exeter City had ever got uh, promoted. Um, the players we had then were we got some terrific players, Dermot Curtis, Arnold Mitchell, Keith Harvey, Graham Reese. But the nice thing about it was we had a fantastic camaraderie together and it really that's that was the one of the main reasons we got promotion. But also we had in the manager, Jack Edwards, it was just completely unbelievable. He really had no assistance at all. Never a deputy, none at all. He he was a sort of manager, physio, kit man, washing man. He did absolutely everything without any help from anybody else uh, in the league. There was two games we played um, in that particular season. One was our very last home game here, which we had to win. And we probably put on our best exhibition of football for many, many years. We've beaten Chesterfield 6-1 here. And obviously, we had to go away the last game of the season to Workington to get a point to get promoted, which we did do. When we uh, got off the train at St. David's Station in the early hours of uh, Sunday morning, that, the platform was absolutely crowded with supporters. Unbelievable. When we got outside of the station, there were thousands and thousands of supporters all with the placards, you know, saying up the city and up, just like things like that. Match that brought some glamour to football in the West Country. The visit of the European champions, Manchester United, to play lowly Exeter City, placed 91st in the fourth. One of the, the, the big highlights, obviously, for me and obviously for a lot of other people in Exeter, was the um, FA Cup game against Manchester United in 1969, where we. At the time, Man United were European champions. Had players in like Best, Charlton, Law, Style, Stephanie. You know, they were the kings of Europe. And obviously, to have them down here in Little Exeter was absolutely fantastic. When, when we played them, we had there was eighteen and a half thousand people here, which nowadays is unbelievable. Oh, I love The ground now has, has changed quite a lot since then, and, and obviously for the better. But the nice thing about this club is, is the fans. They're very, very loyal, and with, without without them, we wouldn't have a football club here. No. here today, I just couldn't believe it, that nothing's changed. <laughs> my paint work might be a little bit better, but it's, it's nothing, you can believe it, you know, and uh, I didn't realise it was so small. Yeah. I mean, I used to sit there and uh, it was, we had managed to warm up here. I mean, yeah, we did. warm ups in the change room. Yeah, and, we'd, uh, we'd go around there and somebody would say, right, knees up, <laughs> you, down. you know, the old studs would be going and you think, Christ almighty. You know, it, Lee Roberts, you get somebody like him, never warm up, he'd sit in the corner. Yeah. Just sit in the corner and thinking about the game, and mm. whereas he needed to, mind you, didn't he? <laughs> 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 but we used, to tr we used to train out here, on the, on the track here, we used, yeah. you know, didn't we, John? You know, you'd have a training day here, and, uh, you know, there's, there's probably 20, 25 players here then, you know, grouped in both, both dress rooms. Yeah, and a lot of banter used to go on, and uh, and we had no we had no facilities here. No, I mean, you'd when come you in on a Monday, and if it was tipping down with rain, we thought, well, what are we going to do today? Is he going to run us around the track? And very often we'd go to the uni. Yeah, you know, if, if they could get in, or we'd go to Barrack Road, the old Barrack, Barrack Road. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there was no uh, cat and fiddle. There was no facilities really. No. But we got on with it. Yeah, but it was it was days when. There wasn't great, co great coaching no. going on. It was just no. a lot of man management. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, and we used to look after ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of the time.
And but that's the way it was, though, John. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I loved it. Loved yeah. it. Wouldn't never both, change both a day. It, no. mm. You know, you'd have the, the big bank, uh, the big bank at the back there, and then you'd have um, the terrace and over there. And I had my fan base over there. Because uh, you know, they used to give it six foot two eyes of blue Jimmy Jarvis after you. So, mm. you know, if I ever scored, that's where I would go. And, and it wasn't would very go. often, mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but, but no, it's, uh, the, the fans were, were brilliant. If they see you giving, giving 100%, mm. you never had no qualms. Mm. But yeah, the, the, the older shot game here uh, was unbelievable atmosphere. I, was, I believe it was 14,000. And as we scored a goal, you know, the fans would run on. I mean, it, we were promoted anyway, but it was fantastic. You, they were often, you, well, you wouldn't get away with it nowadays. What a great goal by a man who could be playing for Wales in two weeks' time. Jennings must be 3-0. There it is. Almost too easy at this stage. Time this match, we get a crowd invasion, but they've still got to wait eight minutes. 3-0, Jennings the scorer. I remember um, being outside the Guild Hall, you know, having game promotion, come, arriving back in Exeter and then going around the town and the coach and being at the top of the Guild Hall, looking down at thousands of people underneath. And it was quite amazing, really. It was it was a good squad then though, John, mm. wasn't it? You know, I knew that when I come come back here, that you know the squad I was coming to, and I thought, you know, we can go on again here. There's yeah. no doubt about it. You know, but again, I think what carried it through a lot was the team spirit was fantastic, yeah. John. It's the best I've ever known. It. One of the great nights of the decade, obviously, was the replay against Newcastle. Perfect performance. Strange, if you like to see us win 4-0, batter a team and Kells done get a goal, but that tells you something about the rest of the team. Fantastic goals. Hatchie were from the corner. Hatchie's corner, not Lee Holmes's corner. The, the flying milkman, Pearson, with his, with his overhead kick, and then the Rogers brothers, either side of half time. Um, just, just fantastic. Huge crowd. The place was buzzing. And for me, it's great because I can nip out, catch the bus home, leg it down uh, Ede Lane, and watch Sports Night with Coleman and watch it all over again. So the 1980s just pretty much sum up being an Exeter City supporter. You start with a, a fantastic team with great characters that, that the fans loved. Brilliant, brilliant nights, brilliant away matches, fantastic FA Cup run, great position in the league. Then, you know, it just, it just can't get any worse, can it? You know, relegation, terrible, terrible performances chaos off the pitch and on it, horrible results, you know, I, you, you don't want to come to your own ground, do you, and go home beating 7-1. Managers who you think, oh, this has got to really turn it around, you know, Jerry Francis, Premiership, or what was the Premiership in those days, England International, no, nothing. You get it interspersed with those moments of, of what being an Exeter City supporter is about, you know, going to Everton in the FA Cup, putting on a really good performance, just really unlucky to lose 1-0. And then you come to the end of that, that decade with an absolutely fantastic team again, new manager, real, real grit, proper, proper football manager, and a, and a really decent team. The, the thing about that team was, 
it went it went it, it was a throwback to teams in the 70s and to some extent in the 60s where this place was fortress you didn't lose you didn't lose at home in the league and you actually seldom lost cup games even against higher opposition this place was fortress st james Bailey. Lovely enterprising play by City, into the area of Vinicom! The Terry Cooper 89-90 team, they, they, they brought that back. We just didn't lose at home. So, so you start with Kello and Delve and Hatchie and Jyler, real fans' favourites, fantastic people who, you know, we see them all now. And then you finish that decade with another bunch of really, really nice people. So yeah, just about sums up uh, being an Exeter City supporter. Yeah, well, the 90s certainly began with, with a bang. Um, probably our only well, championship win in all of our history. Uh, Division Four champions, 1990. A great team then, absolutely super team. Fantastic players. Uh, Kevin Miller, uh, young Scott Hiley and old Clive Whitehead, but they all con contributed fantastically to the team. Stevie Neville, I, I always remember Stevie Neville and Darren Robotham up front, who like the uh, lower level. Um, Russian Dalgleish number of goals that Darren Rowbottom scored was matched by the assist from Steve Neville. The team carried on in awesome form, swept everything before them and uh, we were wandering around St James Park with a trophy, which was just brilliant. Pitch invasions a lot, it was just a, just a wonderful time. And after that we moved up a, a, up a tier and Terry Cooper was manager and it got a little bit more difficult for us really and uh, Alan Ball came in few notable sort of uh, achievements in his time here. Uh, we you know, did the double over Plymouth in one season. I think it's the first time we played them in a good few years. And we did 2-0 and a 3-0 win, which um, clearly went down well with City fans. So uh, we had uh, kind of good times through, but it sort of started to get a little harder. And uh, the club went into a, its latest financial meltdown in 94 and ended up having to, uh, to, to sell the ground to, uh, to survive. Probably a fire sale at that time didn't give us the best price ever. And uh, perhaps the, you know, probably the sale of Martin Phillips was one of the things that, uh, that, that helped to survive at the time. Peter Fox came in in, in the mid 90s. He didn't really have a lot to work with. And uh, I think the second half of a decade was pretty Pretty tricky times, really, as you had to deal with the, you know, the, the, the club having precious little money. Um, the impact of selling the ground meant that, uh, of course, we, we didn't have any collateral to work with. So when you're trying to finance things or do things, we had just nothing to work with. You know, you lose, you, you, you sell at the at the time because it's the right move, but of course. You know, in hindsight, it would, would have been perhaps best to try to do our, our utmost just to keep hold of it because it would have given us, given us something of our own, we would give us some collateral to work with. But that wasn't the case, and so be it. But uh, yeah, things have worked out. We're still here and still going strong. Um, yeah, a little bit more positive sort of sign was right at the end of the decade. We had the redevelopment of what was the cow shed and the, the big bank. Uh, new stands which are sitting in now. Um, sadly it meant uh, that we lost the famous old Primrose Bank which was long in front of the, uh, the cow shed. Very f f famous sort of uh, around football as a little sort of unique thing, another one of our little unique uh, foibles that we had at the park. But, uh, I do know that uh, lots of Primroses or future generations of those original Primroses do exist around Exeter so uh, it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't so bad, they're, they're still there if you want to find them somewhere around Exeter. So, you know, started a decade on a bang, ended it with perhaps a little positive note in the terms of the Grang was sort of getting a, a, a makeover. But, um, you know, there were tougher times ahead in the, in the noughties. Well, we've been 
yeah, I mean, as I said, we were coming to football matches anyway, just as a fan, <clears throat> and uh, bringing you know, Thomas as he got a little bit older, um, and occasionally sort of watching matches. And we came to the South End game, um, and I can remember Paul saying, "We're going to have to leave really, really early because it's going to be very busy, and we may not get a ticket, and we might not get in." Um, and uh, we did, and we were in the 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 old grandstand, and everybody surrounding us had radios listening to the Swansea match. You know what was happening, and Kevin Miller saves the penalty, and we're all really excited. And then, of course, at the end of that, um, no, we weren't. We were out of the league. Um, and I wasn't that it was like okay you know yeah well we'll still be playing football next year I couldn't really get why everybody else around me was was so upset um, and then I think the whole Russell and Lewis thing kind of kicked off and the following week was just bizarre and the news and there were um, you know they were locked out and the police were called and they were arrested and it was like some kind of soap opera didn't really seem to fit with the football club. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, it, it literally fell apart, didn't it? We ended up uh, with, you know, as they as they went. In fact, we got relegated. So um, I was very interested. Then Rod got very interested. Actually, Norman Warren, who's still around doing our quizzes, was a guy who dragged me along to two or three of the trust meetings. And again, I wasn't interested. But I did actually see two or three of those and then the last one I saw somebody called Terry Pavey and Terry Pavey was one of the three people that signed the 288 which is the document you have to sign otherwise the club would have gone into liquidation. It was me Terry and Ian Huxham and I'd seen Terry do a, an organogram and some, well, how it might work and I remember thinking at that time I bet that, I think that's about three or four years away maybe for, but you know what that might have a chance and of course, I think it was no more than about five or six months later that actually it came to, of course, nobody was ready. That wasn't what, but in times of adversity, people get together and they circle around. And uh, whilst I didn't do the deal, the trust did the deal with Ivor Doble. I wasn't in the middle of that deal. I did an awful lot of work to put all the different parties together because something had to happen. And it was the time, I think, um, when the supporters trust stepped in to try and see if they could keep things running and I joined the first work party in May 2003 with others out there weeding and painting and that's how the summer went. I, I think everybody at that time, the thought that the football club might disappear it was one thing to think oh yes okay we've been relegated we're going to be in the conference but then suddenly when you haven't got anything and there's a real chance that, that this club is going to go out of business that people get more involved and I think that's when you know a lot of fans just said okay if I can do something I'll do something there was no there was no harm in trying if we didn't try then there would be no Exeter City Football Club. One of the things I like about that was was, was, was Dino you know Dino not that goal in from I don't know all of, all of 45 50 yards and he's on there he's on the telly he scored the goal and he's happy as Larry. So we've beaten Grimsby we've beaten Doncaster and we're in the yeah, there we are and we're actually in the draw and then that ball came out and you're just looking at the television thinking has that really happened? Of course I was with um, Alex and Steve at his house when that came out well, they jumped up, I nearly fell on the floor, you know, they're jumping around, sort of just, because, you know, a lot of people have put in a mountain of time and, oh my God, the anxiety of, of trying to make it work and to make something that was clearly very, very, very broken in every way, you know, to get that, you know, Eamon had done a great job getting it and then Alex had taken it on again, but it was still a million miles from a, something proper. That was the game that gave us the money to come out of the CVA. So it paid off the debts. It gave us that breathing space. It just took all of the pressure away. I'm not saying that without it, we wouldn't have managed. I, I, I think we probably would because we had the, the red or dead pledges. Um, that money was, was there. Um, and I think that <clears throat> that would have grown as we got closer to the end so we had a substantial amount of money in that anyway 
Lots of people say you wouldn't have made it. I totally disagree. Totally. We would have made it, it would have just taken us a lot longer. You know, we would have got there somehow. I, I have I don't have any shadow of a doubt and I actually rail against people that said, Oh, it was only the man united you would no no, we'd have got there, but it would have just taken longer. In those days, I don't know that the same applies now, but we were quite a big fish. We, we, we had every right to, you know, we were getting good gates. In fact, we were getting, I think we had greys here with five or six thousand, you know, greys. We're a grey, you know, we're a greys now. And and I was never worried before because I see these people pump a load of money in and I see them go out and I see them come back so fast. It do, doesn't happen quite so much now. But, you know, with the right manager, using the money in the right way, with the added of the, the youth players, so then you had then you had momentum. So you, 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 they're coming through. You're, you you've got a good tight team because you have a, a reasonable budget in that. It wasn't the biggest, but it wasn't far off the biggest. So so then the best thing we ever did was lose at Wembley the first time. That's a funny thing for somebody to say, but what that gave us was a huge cash injection. Made the selling of the season tickets and all the other things that were going on so much easier the year after. So the momentum builds again. Great crowds, and we get to the playoffs again. So now you've had a two year roller coaster of things going on, and you get to Wembley and then you win. So now you have the finance again. So during that first year, you've used it to top up and use wisely for your players. You're still bringing young players through, which you're also selling. So now financially, you're really making a, you know, you're, 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 you're gaining momentum. You win the uh, Wembley the second time round. So again, the finance from that and then all the, all the extras that go with it. So now you're attracting the players in. And at that point, Paul had only ever signed out of the conference, only ever signed players that he thought could play in the league above. Well, actually, not only did he do that, but he thought they could play the league above that again. You know, the Ryan Harleys of this world and so on, that people didn't know. So that momentum gained, and then, of course, we went straight through two leagues. Yeah, I, I, well, it, it is going to be one, isn't it, that, that will stick in the history for forever. Because, as I said, you start off with this, you know, the, the standard ownership, Exeter City, you know, always sort of being there or thereabouts, sort of round about the bottom of the football league, um, and or you know, mid table if we're lucky, um, and then all of that bizarre stuff that that surrounded the ownership, and then we end up changing the ownership model that we show we can do it. A supporters, you know, fans can have a say in how their football club is run. They can, they can be an ownership model, a supporters trust own ownership model, and we were the first to do that. So and success, because under that, you know, we got the um, uh, as well as you know, holding Manchester United to a to a draw at Old Trafford in the FA Cup, and then you know, back to back promotions. So yeah, memorable, a memorable decade. Over the last 10 years, we've become, um, through some of my efforts, but mainly by the efforts of everyone, you know, that it's, this, it's the sum of all parts, really. We've become a very healthy, established club, and we've certainly gained credibility. Um, I, I suppose it's hard to pick out one. There's, there's some days in League One, beating Leeds United at home is a favourite in the rain. It was... You know, a two-nil victory, and there was rain, and it was a misty day, and it was just a almost surreal moment. We beat Leeds United, drawn with Liverpool at home recently in the FA Cup was just a magical day for for, for Exeter, not just Exeter Football Club. It was a magical day. It was live on on BBC One match of the day, Friday night. It was prime viewing, and the whole club, the the the, the, the the image of the club was, was was fabulous. It's hard to pick just the one, but um, I think I think probably it would be that Huddersfield at home last game of the season we needed to win to stay up, and we did it.
Well, you've got you've got an old-fashioned stadium that's quirky, that's odd-looking, that's got. If you stand in the in the in the, in the director's box, um, you can look out. You see terrace streets behind the old grandstand. There's there's gaps. There's the railway line. It's it, it's not symmetrical. It's it, it's odd. It's a it's a little bit. You know, if you look behind the facade, there's a it's it's a little bit dilapidated in the corners over you know, the back of the grandstand and. It's then you've got this very imposing terrace, the big bank behind one goal, and which holds thousands of people. And when it's packed, it's fantastic. You could be in a, in a championship ground. You're not talking about a, you know, this sort of symmetrical, stereotypical stadium that we see so often now. That's characterless, and it's you, you turn around, it looks the same one to the other. This is a unique place. The grandstand is. It's, it's had you know hundred hundred plus years of people in and out of it, and it's it's odd and it's quirky and it's it's not fit for purpose anymore in the modern game. But we love it, and it's a bit damp in the places. And you know, you come in every now and then, and the, there's a there's a mushroom growing in the corner on the carpet. You know, it's just got that sort of old damp, horrid feel about it. But we love it, and there's so much about it. And every every week you come into work. For a home game, you recognise faces, the smells, the noises. You can hear the cars in certain parts of the ground, and especially an hour before kickoff, and an hour again, and you know, an hour after the end of the game, when everyone's gone, the game is just gone. You can still sort of feel the hubbub of the day, but it's died down. The number of times I've, I've had my food and I've had a cup of coffee at the end of a Tuesday night game, and it's now eleven o'clock at night. Everyone's gone, and the floodlights go out. And I just sit there, and and you can just and I go out onto the onto the onto the seats, and I just sit there and have a deep breath because my adrenaline's still sky high, and it's all gone quiet. And you hear the seagulls, and, and you know it's just gone, and then it all starts again for the next week. It's just, it's a very it's got it's got its own its own sort of personality and energy, and it's 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 hideous in some in some places. If you if you if you want to look at the away dressing room and the. the, the the, the sole toilet and the shower and the tiles and that it's, it's it's not fit for purpose but you look at some of it and you think it's fantastic and I love I love coming into the ground before a game and looking across to the terrace streets behind the grandstand you can see you can see, you can see the, the the weather about half an hour before it hits you you can see it coming and then it starts and the warm up and the players come in and then the, the supporters come in, the stewards and the same man sits there with his fish and chips an hour and a half before kick off. He, he, he turns up so early and we see him every week and he's up with his fish and chips and he's in the same seat. And there's that sort of feel to it. And after 10 years, it's just become the norm for me. It's become home. But so it's, it, 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 it's, it's wonderful to be a part of all that. And, uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, if whatever happens going forward, I'll be, I'll be, I'll look back very fondly of my time at St James's Park.